Hey, so the other day I saw a flyer for a talk by Bruce Brill on uh, his new book, and it was in conjunction with Jonathan Pollard. So just to tell you know what caught my attention here, uh, Bruce Brill and four other American servicemen who worked for the U.S. National Security Agency in 1973 discovered that U.S. intelligence not only knew Egypt and Syria were going to attack Israel, but knew this for a certainty, knew it days in advance, and knew when the attack would commence. So I, I've heard Bruce talk about this in the past. Um, there's a, a picture of him from back, back in those days. And for me, it was kind of like too scary to believe. I didn't want to, part of me didn't want to believe it. But the more I look at him and I'm going, this person is not making this up. So you were there. Tell us about it. Okay. I know it sounds unbelievable. And back in the early 90s, in 93, you see, yeah, 93 in September, I uh, was interviewed by a major Israeli daily, and they said, this is unbelievable. It's so unbelievable that we have to send you to a polygraph test, a lie detector test. And this is the results of the lie detector test in which they concluded that I speak the truth, that there were rooms in NSA that were unavailable to, to me to enter because I was a Jew. And not only entrance was not allowed, but the knowledge of such rooms that are Jew-free. Tell us more about NSA, for those of us who don't know what the national sec U.S. National Security Agency uh, we, is. We used to joke back in the 70s. NSA, even back then, was much bigger than the CIA, but everyone knew about the CIA, and no one knew about NSA because it kept a very low profile. So we would joke that NSA did not stand for National Security Agency. It stood for no such agency. Oh, wow. It was a joke, but post Edward Snowden, everybody's heard of NSA. Is it still around, the NSA? Is still a... Yeah, sure. Okay. It's still around. Mm -hmm. Edward Snowden isn't. Well, he's still around, but in Moscow, I believe, or somewhere in, the, in Russia. So bring us back there. It's, the book is Deceit of an Ally by Bruce Brill, published by Al Eliakim. Yeah? Eliakim Books, Grass Valley, California. Um, bring us back there. It's 1973. Okay. You, you didn't know that there were rooms that were not accessible? I learned about that afterwards while I was still working at the agency, but not in 73, in 74. Already in 74, I was transferred from the Arabic section because I was trained in Arabic and stationed. My permanent duty station was Fort Meade, NSA, and I worked as an Arabic Middle East Analyst. Is that you on the with the earphones listening in? That is a new improved version of me. That's my youngest son. Oh, oh wow. Dressed in my army. Oh uniform. wow. He looks like you. That's that's Bruce. Okay, great. Yeah, he's a, a new improved. He's version. dressed in your so what was your position in the army? how did you I was a specialist you? fourth class. That was my rank which if you want to know in traditional terms it's lower than a buck sergeant did 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 the army treat you in arabic uh language yeah 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 uh -huh. we had 47 week arabic language training out in Dilliwick defense language institute west coast in oh monterey, you were at Dilliwick in monterey. monterey oh my gosh right and so, okay, so they put you on listening and you're 
listening right. to what well, are you listening to Arabic? Okay. So radio by, by October, by October, I had been studying Hebrew for about a year or more on my own. And so I was one of the few analysts that could just both Arabic and Hebrew. So on the first day of the Yom Kippur War, I was monitoring live communication from the battlefront. That's why I chose that picture as the cover, because I'm looking down over what was transpiring on the battlefront the first days of the Yom Kippur War. That's why I chose that uh, cover. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but the import, the important part of my story is not what happened on the first day, but what happened several days before that I knew, I personally knew that Syria and Egypt were going to attack Israel on October 6th. In the words of my supervisor, who informed me, he said, the sh hits the fan on Saturday. Saturday, October 6th, was Yom Kippur. Mm. And I asked him, certainly this is another... They like that week in October, huh? That's there. <laughs> yeah, they like that week in October. <laughs> Especially... So I asked him, certainly this is a false oh, alarm, because there were several false alarms earlier that year, where there were um, military movements by the Syrians and Egyptians, and it looked like it could be staging for an attack. And in fact, Israel thought that they might be staging for an attack, and they called up the reserves to be prepared, and nothing happened. So I told my On supervisor, false alarms. Mm -hmm. I told my supervisor, certainly this is another false alarm. Mm -hmm. And he answered me saying, no, this time the, as I said, the, it's the fan on Saturday. And this is a vow, meaning there was no doubt. So we knew. And on the first day of the Yom Kippur war, when I was monitoring, live communication from the battlefront. I learned that the Israelis were surprised. So, of course, I was surprised that they were surprised. Hence the name Deceit of an Ally. Right. It's, it's a problematic name because it seems to suggest that it's anti-American. And it's anything but anti-American. It's anti-anti-American. Because what could be more anti-American than having secret cells within the intelligence community right. that are taxpayer funded yeah. and they work against American stated foreign policy where Israel is an ally and they worked against Israel. Right. This is, this is what we were talking about previously. Um, and maybe we'll just, you know, conclude with this and one more question, which is we talked about the um, anti-Semitic elements within the military, right? And you said, well, they're also, for each anti-Semitic element, there is a pro-Semitic element. Right. Those just don't sell books. So. Right. That's what the, uh, the publish friend who helped me publish this, he said, pro-Semitism doesn't sell books. So that's why he came up with this subtitle, A Memoir of Military Antisemitism. That sells books. I'll give you a couple examples of this anti and pro. I began keeping kosher. I don't know if your viewers know what that means. Basically, basically, it means you don't eat pig products. And in the American Army mess hall, everything is cooked with lard. At least it was back in 73, 71 when I went in. And here I am, I'm trying to keep kosher. And even vegetables are cooked with lard. Okay. So I couldn't even eat the vegetables. I was eating hard boiled eggs and salad. That's what I was living on. And I found out we were at a mixed service base in the Presidio of Monterey that the Zoomies, the Air Force guys, went to their headquarters and said, I'm a Hindu. 
I need separate rats, meaning separate rations, because I can't eat in the mess hall because I'm a Hindu. And they would just make this up. And it was a way of padding their uh, monthly salary check. And here I am starving. Oh, that's rations is their monthly salary check. Right. Yeah, they, okay. they give you a, uh -huh. an additional allowance. Uh -huh. I hear so you are starving. And here I am starving. So I went to my headquarters, my army headquarters, and they told me to get lost. I go back to my Arabic language class. and We had a, a lieutenant colonel in the class who was a real gentleman. Yeah. I mean, not judging by his mouth, because he, he had a mouth that could make a sailor blush, okay. but he was um, a noble personality. And he asked me what happened. I told them, they told me to get lost. He said, you go back and you officially apply. So I went back and I officially applied and the process began. And the first step of the process was they sent me to the post chaplain. And I don't remember if he was Protestant or Catholic, what flavor Christian he was, but he asked me, um, why are you asking for separate rations? I said, because I'm a Jew. He said, yes, but what biblical chapter? And I knew the chapter. I was really proud of myself. Leviticus 11. So he opens his Bible to the New Testament, and he says, and Jesus said, it's more important oh what comes out of your mouth than what goes into your mouth. He closes his Bible, and he denies me oh the separate rats. Mm. He doesn't approve it. Mm. So I go back to Arabic language class, oh. and this lieutenant colonel asked me what happened. I told him. He was so, you could see the smoke coming out of his ears. He stomps out of the classroom, straight to headquarters. Within 20 minutes, there was a runner sent from headquarters. Specialist Brill, you're requested to come to headquarters. They had all the paperwork approved and written up wow. for me. So there's an, a beautiful example mm. of pro-Semitism. Wow. He saw that, uh, you know, this Jew boy is being dumped on because he's a Jew. Yeah. By the chaplain. Right. By the right. chaplain. Right. So he really was pissed. Wow. That, that's one example. There was another example of when I was working in NSA as an analyst in the Arabic uh, section, my immediate supervisor was an anti-Semite. Uh, take my word for it. And if you can't take my word for it, he wrote me an eval that was a terrible eval. Eval is an evaluation, enlisted man's evaluation uh, report. And it was horrible. And it became like the talk of mid-management in, in the, the whole floor. And one Air Force top sergeant, and I can't mention his name because they made me redact it. Who's they? I'll tell you in a moment. It's redacted, so I can't mention his name. Um, he caught wind of this. What does he, redacted mean? For redacted means they... Maybe I can, sh they say a picture is worth a thousand words, right? Maybe I can show you an example. See the blacked out areas. Oh, gosh. That's they made me remove that's because censored. I sent the manuscript to the Pentagon and they reviewed it and said, you can publish it under two conditions. One is that you redact. You removed what they require. And throughout the book, there are redactions. And number two, you don't add one word of new content. And after so this, whole, this whole book, in other words, is 